Miraculously, the woman is still alive and still pregnant. Isaiah is clutching a photograph and beating his meat. The picture Isaiah was holding on to belonged to none other than his dad. What the f are we watching? For 13 years, mom refuses to birth her child until father returns. In the first story, we see a pregnant woman who is crying and begging her husband to not leave her. It is the month of December, and the entire city is covered in a thick blanket of snow. The woman can barely walk due to her eight-month pregnancy, but despite Damn. this, her husband is adamant on leaving. Hey, that nigga like me for real! We, we, we pip and then we dip. Yes, sir. Says that he will be back in a few days after gathering some supplies. Before going out, though, he hands her a jar of magical roots, which will apparently prevent the baby from being born. What the fuck? 13 years pass by, but the man is still not returned. The house is in a state of utter chaos, as we see maggots crawling through the sea of garbage and filth. Miraculously, the woman is still alive and still pregnant. The roots seem to have worked, but the only problem is that her baby has grown inside of her womb. It is now because- What if she has, like, a 13-year-old in there? Ew. And he's like, he's going to school in her womb. Ew. Become the size of an adult human, because of which the woman is unable to stand up or move properly. Wow, that thing's a bigger baby than I dubs. She is still hopeful that her husband will return soon, and so she keeps calling. That's a crazy shot that I just picked up. That nigga said a bigger baby than I dubs. It's a wild ass shot. Out his name. Shockingly, the baby inside of her womb has now started talking. Its gender is not specified, but it can make genuine conversations with the woman, like asking her, what they're going to have for food. Or when is dad coming? Or how many years until AI takes over the planet? One day. What the fuck is ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> that nigga that nigga doing the renegade in there, the bro? Woman what the hell? Someone's pet cat in her trap and eats it for dinner. While the act is very ruthless and inhumane, it is the only way she can survive. However, she lies to her baby that she cooked a rabbit so as not to offend it. That night, as the woman is getting ready to sleep, what she the experiences hell? extreme contractions due to her pregnancy. She rushes to the jar to ingest the root, but sadly for her, they are no more. It appears as if the woman ate the last strand in the morning. The sight of the empty jar terrifies her, and she drops it to the floor, crying. Just then, the baby inside of her announces that it is coming out. The woman begs it to stop, saying please- Why do you keep doing that voice? It is coming out. <laughs> Don't leave me, but the baby has made up its mind. It simply says, there is enough room for the two of us. Oh God. The next second, the giant baby starts twisting inside ah! the woman's body, causing her to die in an instant. Then a gruesome montage shows the woman being completely disemboweled by the baby. Ch God. A few hours later, after the procedure ends, the baby in the body of its mother stands up for the first time. It cleans up the excess flesh on the floor, throws it outside, and then sews its own stomach. Some weeks later, we see the baby living a completely normal life. What do you mean living a completely normal life? What? I life. It has made the house neat and tidy along with itself. Right then, it's how? It doesn't know anything. It just it just got born. How? Try to erase my memory. Father arrives at the door after 13 long years. He acts as if he was only gone for a day or two. The baby looks at him in disbelief, but the man, who is unaware of what happened, approaches it with lust in his eyes. <laughs> The movie ends as he unzips the baby's clothes to make romance with it. Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? That can't be how it- That can't be how it ends. Nigga, you picked a story! What do you mean that can- You picked it! <laughs> I gotta draw some kind of line, man. The second movie starts in a rural village in America, where a six-year-old boy named Troy lives with his parents. His dad, Jeffrey, is a neo-Nazi skinhead who despises everyone apart from his own race. Troy's mom, Krista, wow. however, is a well-mannered and calm lady. Dis why are y'all together then? Like, why did this happen if you're with the racist? Like, you're just as bad as the racist. Despite being an odd couple, the two love their son a lot and always make sure that he is happy. One day, they go on a trip with some other neo-Nazis and have a fun time at the beach. Jeffrey bets against everyone that his son can land a perfect aim with his rifle. This gets everyone excited, so they bet $50 each. To okay. their surprise, the six-year-old expertly manages to strike his target from a distance. This makes Jeffrey very proud. Is this gonna warp around to him killing black people? I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. I'm very curious on how this, how this story is gonna flip around, bro. And he quickly collects the winning cash from his gang. At night, the family goes to a department store to spend their winnings. Troy is given the freedom to choose anything he wants, including beer and chocolate. 
While they are at the counter, Troy spots a black man named JD playing with a toy and innocently smiles at him. JD also smiles back, and the two seem to have formed an instant bond. However, their happy moment is rudely cut short when the racist Jeffrey scolds the man for looking at his son. He even speaks some racial slurs. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? Them niggas are neo-Nazis, but still we brought Negroes into it. I don't. In front of everyone. As expected, this enrages JD, and he curses at Jeffrey before leaving the store. Unfortunately, the altercation turns out to be the start of a brutal war. Jeffrey, who is infuriated war. that he was cursed at, immediately calls his gang and asks them to arrive outside the store. Krista tries her best to calm her husband down, but all in vain. Even little Troy can do nothing but watch his father become aggressive more and more by the second. Soon, the gang arrives and they beat the hell out of the man in front of his own family. JD's kids are terrified inside their car, but their screams and cries for help only fall on deaf ears. After the beatdown is done, Jeffrey makes sure to humiliate the poor man even more by pouring a gallon of milk over his face. Joke. What did I say? Somehow, we, la we looped around to black people. How did we accomplish that? Why is that what happened? I felt like we should have had nothing to do with the story, but somehow we are here. Jokes on you, bitch. Milk's delicious. <laughs> All this is observed by one of JD's sons, Brawny, who appears to have vengeance in his eyes. The next morning, Jeffrey takes his son out for a ride as if nothing has happened. They hike the forest, roam the city, and then prepare to return home at night. However, on the way, they are stopped by a mysterious van, which yes. is blocking the road. Yes. As usual, Jeffrey becomes aggressive and gets out of his car to take matters yes. into his own hands. But when he approaches the van, a group of guys beats him up Beat and leaves him inside. Oh. Little Troy notices this from his car and he screams screams at the men to let his dad go. He even runs behind their van for quite some distance, but in the end, <laughs> he gets tired and- For quite some distance. That man took a total of 10 steps. He did not like his dad. He ran for 10 steps. Eventually gives up. Surprisingly, the perpetrator behind the entire operation is revealed to be none other than Brawny. He has meticulously planned something evil to- ex W LeBron's son, bro. LeBron, you raised your son to be such a well-defined gentleman. Golly. Exact vengeance for what happened to his dad. In the next scene, an unconscious Jeffrey is brought to a shitty looking apartment where several of Brawny's men tie him up and start working on him. At first, they inject him with various substances. Then, they shave his entire body. They're actually planning to tattoo him from top to bottom. What the, the fuck procedure is happening? takes several days, and by the end of it, Jeffrey has become completely unrecognizable. One night, he is dropped off at the same location where he was abducted. Due to the large amounts of narcotics present inside his body, Jeffrey is not able to walk or talk properly. Jeez. Jesus so he drags Christ. himself all the way home. When he finally sees himself in the car's mirror, he is taken aback to learn that he has become completely black. The <laughs> gangsters they made him a Negro! Oh, man. Why is being black a punishment? We got to pick cotton all day long. <laughs> ...have tattooed every single inch of his body. As Jeffrey begins to panic, Krista suddenly wakes up from her sleep and assumes that an intruder is trying to barge into her house. So, she immediately springs into action and brings out a handgun. After she asks Troy to hide, she slowly heads Shoot towards the door to confront man. the intruder. To her shock, she sees a dark, man. completely undressed male coming towards her. Krista is about to shoot at him, but right then, she realizes that the man is actually her husband. Damn it! She slowly lowers her weapon in disbelief, but the next second, a loud bang is heard, and Jeffrey drops to the floor. It turns out little <laughs> Troy has shot his own father from behind, mistaking him for an intruder. At the beginning of the third story- W white boy, man, see, look, that's how a good story ends. That is, that is what we do right there. That's what Darman needs to have in some of his videos, bro. He just needs a little bit of murders. Darman just needs to sprinkle a little bit of murder seasoning over his videos and they would be mwah, you know what I'm saying? Dory, a young teenager named Isaiah is clutching a photograph and beating his meat. Well, that's one way to start a start story. When his dad, Sydney, suddenly walks in, the atmosphere is tense and awkward for a few seconds. Will but Smith! Then, uh, Sydney approaches his son and- My man is beating with a Mario mushroom as a lamb. He has a big little bear in the front of him. Bro, this is not the best scenery to be beaten to. Like, at least have like a picture of Nami or Nico Robin on the- Let me stop, bro. It starts explaining that this is very normal. Everyone does it in their free time because it's a fun thing to do. When Isaiah nervously asks his dad if he does it, Sydney says, yes. Don't touch me while I was just touching my meat, bro. It's not the type of reassurance I need because I'm gonna feel really weird if it stiffens back up. 
Boy, you got here just in time. This makes the teenager a bit more relaxed, and he thanks his dad for being an understanding person. However, when Sydney leaves the room, it is shockingly revealed that the picture Isaiah was holding onto belonged to none other than his dad. What the fuck? Are we watching? Did I low key call it in a weird ass way? I felt like I called it in a weird way. This is this is fucking crazy, bro. It was supposed to be a joke. It was supposed to be a ha ha he he moment. God, bro. Me and this nigga Isaiah are twins. Oh my. <laughs> what is this? What is this? This is my being punished. <sighs> 14 years later, it is the biggest day of Isaiah's life. He is getting married. However, Sydney doesn't look happy at all. This is because he is constantly abused and harassed by his own son. I'll be gentle with you. Don't worry. How the hell did we get here? How did we travel to this side of the internet? Even during the family picture, Isaiah cannot stop running his fingers through his dad's body. Later, we see Sydney's wife Joan chatting and having a good time with all the guests. But when she doesn't see her husband and son around, she becomes worried and starts looking for them. As she reaches near the toilet, she hears some grunting sounds, which she clearly recognizes. Joan nervously peeks through the door, and what she witnesses sends chills down her spine. Her own son is doing it. I think I'm about to, I, I'm, I, oh, what the fuck is this? Oh my god, man. I have to narrate this. This is my, this is my life. Days pass, but Sydney is still tormented by his son. Even his wife doesn't do anything to stop the monster. With no one to call for help, Sydney pours out his entire story in a memoir, which he titles Cocoon Man. Unfortunately, what? he blames himself for being tough on his son. A pretty good name, just like a metapod or a cocoona. He does appear to know how to use Harden. Unfortunately, he blames himself for not being tough on his son while he was growing up. A few months later, Sydney finishes his memoir, prints it, and then leaves it in the bedroom, hoping that his wife can read it whole and discover the tragic story. He is actually unaware that Joan already knows the truth. Unfortunately, before she can come out of the bathroom, Isaiah finds the memoir. He angrily confronts Sydney about it, and also warns him against making any copies in the future. Isaiah promises that he will unleash hell on his dad if the same case repeats again. Sadly, what is work like? Oh, how much hell can you release? You, you fucked to me. I am your father, and 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 you bent me over, and and and, and you treated me like yeah, ah. Ah, like <laughs> the terrified old man has no choice but to comply. One day, as Sydney is relaxing in the bathtub, wearing headphones, Isaiah suddenly starts knocking on the door. Sydney doesn't hear it, and this only makes the monster more aggressive. In a fit of rage, he breaks open the door and torments the poor man, making him scream for help. Downstairs, Joan hears everything, but she is too scared to react. She simply turns on the volume of her television and sobs in despair. This turns out to be the last straw for Sydney. So, the next morning, he gathers enough courage and prints another copy of the memoir. He now plans to submit it to the nearest publication and disclose all of his son's evil deeds. But unfortunately, just as he is about to exit the house, Isaiah catches him red-handed. He chastises his dad and calls him a traitor, saying he genuinely loved him. He also rants about how no one ever cared about him and his family. Love? <laughs> Buddy, you have an interesting way to, uh, of, of displaying love. I'm not gonna lie to you. Your way of displaying love is uh, quite uh, unique. Some may say, yeah. The long and rage-filled speech certainly moves Sydney, but he quickly shakes off his emotions to focus on his mission. He rushes out of the door and reaches the road, only to be hit by an oncoming truck. Isaiah witnesses the whole incident and becomes traumatized. He holds his dad's lifeless body and starts crying in the middle of the road. And soon after, Joan also joins him. In this way, an innocent, kind, and lovable man was killed because of his son's horrible actions. Cut to some days later, Sydney's funeral is organized and several people have arrived to pay their respects to the well-respected writer. This is when a grief-stricken Joan finally decides to confront her son. She corners him in a room yes. and asks, when did it start? Press As that expected, man. Isaiah tries to divert the topic, Press Joan that man. doesn't budge. When the conversation gets heated, she slaps him right across the face, and he does the same. Then they start striking each other with random ah! objects. Due to ah! his physical presence, Isaiah gains the upper hands and is about to shove Joan into a lit fireplace. But luckily, she finds a fire Stop that man! and hits him she then stabs him several times until he stops moving. The movie ends with Joan's gut-wrenching cries. In a matter of days, she has lost her entire family. Kind of sick. Oh, holy God. I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what we just watched, and I will need psychological help after, after witnessing all this.